This is the Registered Behavior Technician course presented by Shaza Tar. The course content was created by Shaza Tar and is the property of Autism Therapy and Training, Inc. All rights are reserved. This training program is based on the Behavior Analyst Certification Board 2018 RBT Task List 2nd Edition and is designed to meet the 40-hour training requirement for the RBT credential. The program is offered independent of the BACB. Remember, in each class, we will have our active listening, a quiz, and a competency assessment. Hello everyone, welcome to our measurements class. I'm your course instructor, Shaz Attar. Remember, in each class, you'll have a quiz to complete at the end. And during my talk, I'll say some of my favorite Scrabble words and other secret words which will be on the quiz as well, so be sure you're listening. Today we're going to start talking about the first items on our task list. We'll be discussing data collection and the different methods we can collect data. We'll start off by talking about how to prepare for data collection, implementing continuous measurement procedures such as frequency, duration, implementing discontinuous measurement procedures, and implementing permanent product recording procedures. Aristotle once said that quality is not an act, it is a habit. And taking data and recording it doesn't happen overnight, and you don't become good at it without practice. The more you make data collection a habit, the better you'll become at it. In practice, the reality is so much is happening. If you're a teacher in a classroom, you have maybe 20 other kids you have to attend to. And if you're an instructor therapist working with clients in an IBI program, you're dealing with behaviors, classroom routines, lunch spills, and so on. So is it okay to neglect data? Or maybe not write it down? Or maybe you just you'll just write it down later. Measuring behavior is one of the most important elements of behavior analysis. It allows a practitioner to quantify a behavior, show clear behavior changes, and it also shows the effectiveness of a treatment. So it helps end treatments based on pseudoscience. And finally, therapists can be accountable to clients, employers, and society. Without data, we have nothing. We can't determine if the behavior has improved or not. We can't see if the procedure being used should be continued or not. We need to ensure we are running programs and protocols that are based on data. Many years ago, when I was doing home therapy, I took on a family that was going through a transition from one provider to me. I sat down with the current therapist to look at the child's programs and progress to see where things were. I looked at the program binder and everything was in percentages. I thought, great. So I asked, is he getting about 70% on his skills? And the therapist said, well, it's an approximation. I didn't quite understand what she meant. She explained further that they would run 10 trials and out of those trials, then they would guess how many he got right. As you can see, that information wasn't very helpful. I had no idea whether or not he truly had these skills or not, and the data really meant nothing. Good data, clear data, will really make a difference for your client. We owe it to them. Being prepared for your session is most important. Before you get started, you will need a timer or stopwatch. You can also use a clock, but I find that it can be less accurate, so it's better to use a timer or stopwatch. You will also need a tally counter. These are great when counting behaviors, and they can be attached to your belt or pant loop or on a lanyard and put it around your neck. You will need paper and a pen or pencil, a clipboard to keep your sheets together and tidy, and finally the data sheets. As the behavior technician, it's important that you gather these items prior to your session. You may need other things such as program material or specific things that your learner likes such as reinforcers, specific activities, academic worksheets, token boards, and so on. Firstly, you need to know what behavior you're looking at. 
So there needs to be a clear definition of the behavior. Remember, behaviors need to be defined in observable and measurable terms. If you can hear it, smell it, see it, taste it, it's observable. If you can count it, it's quantifiable. Clearly defining the behavior helps practitioners identify when that behavior has occurred. The next thing we need to determine is the method of data collection. Are we going to count it or maybe just time it? We need to gather appropriate items to help us collect that data. What are some of the things you may need? Then you need to actually collect the data. And finally, graph the data and analyze it with your supervisor. So let's break this down further and talk about the dimensions of behavior. We want to ensure that what we are gathering is the right information about the behavior of interest. What are the dimensions of behavior? We will cover repeatability, temporal extent, temporal locus. The first dimension of behavior is repeatability, which is counting the number of times the behavior occurs. This is referred to as frequency and rate. They are short and quick behaviors. So if we wanted to measure something like hitting, frequency would be the great measure. Hitting is a short and quick behavior. Temporal extent is a behavior that occurs for a length of time. These behaviors typically last for some time and have a clear beginning and end. For example, the length of time you can hold your breath underwater. Temporal locus is a behavior that occurs at some point in time in relation to other events. These are known as latency and inner response time. For example, you may be interested in measuring when someone starts crossing the street, when that walk signal starts flashing. Measuring the wrong dimension of the behavior can be problematic in finding an effective treatment for your client. Let me explain further. I want you to measure the number of times I say, um, okay? Easy enough. Here we go. Um, um. Now you probably counted two instances of the behavior, right? So now this appears as a low frequency behavior, which may not be problematic. However, what if you took duration data instead? Your results would be quite different. Although the frequency may be low, the length of the behavior is quite long and may be problematic. Let's use this in a real life situation. Imagine you have a child who is engaging in screaming behavior. They scream, two times. If you brought this to your supervisor's attention, they might say, well, it's a low frequency behavior. It's not a problem. However, you might say, yes, it's low, but these screams are long. So you had to measure the length of the scream. It would probably get your supervisor's attention. Imagine each scream lasted 30 seconds. Now that's a problem. Let's move on to the types of measurement. There are two types of measurement, continuous measurement and discontinuous measurement. Continuous measurement is implemented when every instance of the behavior is collected throughout the day. Frequency and rate, duration, latency, and inner response time can be used to collect the behavior all day long. I'm gonna break this down further, but before I do, I want you to take a stretch, take a deep breath, because we've already talked about so much and I wanna throw in my first Scrabble word. Like I said in my intro class, I'm an avid Scrabble player and I love using words that no one usually uses or thinks of so I could win. But of course, everyone ends up learning them and using them against me. So the first word is chi, spelt Q-I. And for your own knowledge, it means the circulating life force whose existence and properties are the basis of much Chinese philosophy and medicine. All right, let's continue. One of the first uh, continuous measurement procedures I wanna discuss is frequency and rate. These are the number of times a behavior occurs per unit. Frequency is used when the observation period is the same each day. For example, the child attends the program every day from nine to three. With frequency, we would say that the behavior occurred eight times per session, uh, per session, knowing that the session is six hours long. Rate varies in that the observation period differs from day to day. 
At our center, some children may come for three hours one day, five hours another day. With rate, you'll need to take the number of uh, behaviors divided by time. For example, eight hits divided by two hours equals four. This means that the behavior occurred about four times an hour. If I were to count the number of times a child screamed per unit of time, the amount would look different based on the number of hours they attended. Let me demonstrate this in a more visual way. In this graph, you'll see on the left side a frequency graph in which a child engaged in the behavior hitting. The learner hit eight times on Monday, nine times on Tuesday, eight times on Wednesday, and nine times on Thursday. The child attends the program for two hours each day. The next slide shows the data and length of the session for screaming behavior. The number of behaviors are identical to the hitting behavior graph. So once again, eight on Monday, nine on Tuesday, eight on Wednesday, and nine on Thursday. On Monday, the child attended the program for two hours and had eight behaviors. This means you take the number of behaviors divided by time, so in this case, eight divided by two, which equals four. As you can see on the bottom chart, on Tuesday, there were nine behaviors, but the session was only an hour long, so nine divided by one, which equals nine, and so on. So you can see that there were rates of four, nine, eight, and 4.5. When we look at the graph, Visually, it looks very different than the frequency graph. We see the rate of behavior per hour, which is more accurate. If we put the two graphs side by side, you can see the difference visually. Even though the number of times the behavior occurred was identical, it's different because the hours of the session are shorter on the rate graph, and if graphed this way is more accurate. Otherwise, if it was graphed as frequency, it would appear that the behavior was greater on one day versus another. Frequency and rate behaviors are short, lived, and quick, such as a hit, kick, pinch, scream, bite, or throwing objects. You can count the behavior. To count these behaviors, you will need some kind of instrumentation to collect that number. You can use a tally counter, make marks on paper, or use small objects like beads to count behaviors. So let's practice this. I want you to imagine that I'm speaking at a conference for behavior analysis, and you notice that I say whoops a lot during my talks. You've mentioned it to me, but I don't really believe you. So I want you to count the number of times I say whoops in my speech. Here we go. Welcome everyone to the great world of behavior analysis. Whoops, I just dropped my pencil. Moving on, I'm excited to share the whoops. Geez, where was I? Yes, I was saying that I'm excited about sharing behavior analysis with you. Oh, whoops, so sorry. Whoops, I spilt my water all over my speech. All right, well, that speech didn't go so well. How many times did I say whoops? If you counted four, then you're absolutely right. Way to go. What not to do. Don't keep count in your head. You'll forget. Many therapists that I've overseen in the past will often say that they're really good at keeping count in their head and they'll write it down later. I'd say that this is quite sloppy and I don't recommend this at all. Once this becomes a habit, your work in behavior analysis will just become poor and unethical. Next, let's talk about duration. Duration is the length of time of the behavior. The behavior has a clear beginning and end. You can measure this behavior using a timer or stopwatch. You can start timing the behavior when it first occurs and stop the timer when the behavior ends. For example, how long crying lasted how long a child was off task, how long a child was playing with Lego. Let's practice this one. I want you to take duration data on the length of time of this next behavior. You'll need a timer of some sort. Don't panic if you don't have a stopwatch. Uh, you can use your phone or computer uh, to measure this behavior. Time how long it takes the lady, let's call her Jenny, to drink water. Remember, you need to time it from the beginning of the behavior until the end. So when does drinking start? We may define that as once the water touches her lips until the glass is removed from her lips.
How long was the behavior? If you need to do it again, just rewind a bit and try it again. Practice the use of the timer. Now you might find that the duration that you got was not exact. This all depends on when you actually started the timer, so slight variations are possible. But as long as you're really close to the amount, you should be good. Learning to be quick with your timer will be a skill you can work on. So I got 4.97 seconds. Avoid using a clock that does not have a second hand. You may not get accurate measures. If your instrumentation for collecting data is missing or not good, be sure to address this. I know at our center the batteries always die on our timers, so having backup batteries and enough timers for all is essential. Let's talk about latency. With latency, you begin measuring when the SD is presented. The SD is a stimulus that is given to trigger the behavior. For example, if I say clap your hands, that is the SD that will trigger you to clap your hands. In a later class, we'll talk about SDs, so I don't want to go into it too much, but just remember, an SD is not always an instruction. It may be a signal or a symbol that triggers a behavior as well. I'll explain shortly. With latency, we want to see how long it takes before the learner engages in the behavior. You will need a stopwatch. Start the timer when the instructions or SD is given or presented, then stop the timer when the learner engages in the behavior. For example, suppose your learner is playing with blocks on the floor and you say, come back to the table. How long did it take for the learner to leave the blocks and start heading towards the table? In school, this is often an important measure when asking the learners to do their work, worksheets or read a book. How long does it take before the learner starts their worksheet? This can be an important measure for behaviors like crossing the road. When the walk signal is presented, does it take the client 20 seconds to engage in walking when they see the signal or 5 seconds? Suppose the walk signal lit up with the walk symbol and your client started walking 20 seconds later, but the signal had already changed to a stop signal. This could be very dangerous for your client. So this would be an important measure. We want them to start walking a couple seconds after that symbol lights up. Before we practice, let's do another Scrabble word. So take a moment, stretch, move your neck around. So the Scrabble word is Z, spelt Z-A. This word is a slang shortening of the word pizza. You may be surprised at the slang found in Scrabble. I sure was, but I use it all the time. Z is the most played word containing the letter Z and the only playable two letter word with the letter Z. So if you ever start playing Scrabble, don't forget to use it. Okay, so let's practice this. You'll see a video of someone crossing the street. Start the timer when, they, when the walk symbol appears and stop it once the person starts walking. Ready? So how long was the behavior? If you got six seconds, then you're absolutely right. Let's move on to inner response time. Inner response time measures the time between behaviors. Using a stopwatch or timer, start the timer at the end of one behavior, stop the timer at the onset of the next behavior. In school, teachers may be interested in the time it takes the student to do math questions. The teacher may measure the time between finishing question one and starting question two. Inner response time is also used for measuring the time from one year in accident to the next. The learner may have an accident on Monday at 2 p.m., then another accident on Tuesday at about 2 p.m., which gives us an inner response time of 24 hours. Let's practice this. You're going to measure the inner response time of this little guy's watermelon eating. So the time between bites. Start your timer at the end of the first bite and stop the timer at the beginning of the next bite.
how long did you get? Remember, rewind and play it again for practice purposes. If you got six seconds, then you're absolutely right. This chart here is to help you review the different measures so that you can remember when to start and stop your timer. Remember, quick behaviors that can be counted use frequency or rate to measure them. Behaviors that are long lasting, such as playing with toys, use duration. When you're interested in looking at how long it takes for the learner to follow your instructions, latency is a perfect measure. And finally, inner response time is when you're interested in measuring between behaviors. This chart will help you during your studying uh, process, so good luck. Kelly is an RBT and was asked to measure her learner's behavior. She gets a tally counter, data sheet, and pencil. What continuous measurement is she about to use? A. Frequency rate B. Duration C. Latency or D. Inner response time And the correct response is A. Frequency and rate Helen is a teacher and has noticed that her student Bob leaves the table to get an eraser. He takes his time walking around the classroom, looking at his peers before getting back to his seat. What continuous measurement should Helen use to measure how long he stays away from the table? A. Frequency rate B. Duration C. Latency or D. Inner response time And the correct response is B, duration. Well done. Helen is a teacher and notices that Jenny takes a long time to copy words off the board. Helen decides to time how long it takes between each word. What continuous measurement is Helen using? A, frequency rate. B, duration. C, latency, or D, inner response time. And the correct response is D, inner response time. Linda is an RBT who is taking data on the number of times Johnny bangs the table with his fist. What continuous measurement is Linda using? A, frequency rate, B, duration, C, latency, or D, inner response time. And the correct response is A, frequency rate. Way to go. Linda sends Johnny to go play with his toys. When she calls him back to the table and she begins timing, she stops her timer as he gets up and heads back to the table. What continuous measurement is Linda using? A. Frequency rate B. Duration C. Latency or D. Inner response time And the correct response is C, latency. Which one defines latency? A, time between behaviors. B, time from the instruction to the onset of the behavior. C, count. Or D, length of the behavior. And the correct response is B, time from the instruction to the onset of the behavior. Which one defines inner response time? A, time between behaviors. B, time from the instruction to the onset of the behavior. C, count. Or D, length of the behavior. And the correct response is A, time between behaviors.
Good work. Which one defines duration? A. Time between behaviors. B. Time from the instruction to the onset of the behavior. C. Count. Or D. Length of the behavior. And the correct response is D. Length of the behavior. Which one defines frequency or rate? A. Time between behaviors. B. Time from the instruction to the onset of the behavior. C. Count. D. Length of the behavior. And the correct response is C. Count. Good job. Take the total number of behaviors and divide it by the length of the session. Is which of the following? A. Frequency or B. Rate. And the correct response is B. Rate. Sometimes taking data all day can be very challenging or even impossible. Using discontinuous measurement can help our practice since it allows a practitioner to sample small intervals at different points of the day. Time sampling is when an observation period is broken down into smaller intervals of time, such as 10 seconds. The observer will indicate the presence or absence of the behavior. This method is often used when observing continuously is not feasible, as I mentioned before. In practice, whether it's at school, home, or at a center, a caregiver, teacher, or other professional may not be able to observe the behavior for long periods of time. Discontinuous measurements allow the observer to collect segments of the behavior. This simplifies data collection, but, is, but it isn't the best method of data collection, and it's important to be aware of this. Since you're only taking a sample of the behavior, it may over or underestimate a behavior. Let's get into the three types of time sampling methods. But before we do that, here is your next Scrabble word. Are you ready? So the word is another favorite of mine. I like this one because it's the letter X and if you put it on a good spot, then you get lots of points. Um, and the word is SU, which is spelled X-U, and it is the monetary unit of Vietnam. Okay, moving on. The three types of time sampling methods are partial interval recording, whole interval recording, and momentary time sampling. Observation periods are often five minutes in length, and the intervals are broken down into five or ten seconds. Partial interval recording is when you indicate the occurrence of a behavior at any time that it occurred during that interval. The key here is any time the behavior occurs. So if you were to, to be observing a child, let's say engaging in self-stimulatory behaviors such as hand flapping, if the behavior occurred during that interval, let's say it was a 10 second interval, and you would mark it at any point during that time. When the behavior occurs during an interval, mark it down using a plus or an X. This would indicate that there was an occurrence. If the behavior does not occur, mark it using a minus or a zero. This would indicate that there was no occurrence. For partial interval recording, the behavior can occur at any time during the interval. For example, here is a five second interval. I have broken it down into one second intervals just to show you that when the behavior occurs at any point during that interval, we would count it. If the interval is five seconds long and the behavior occurred three seconds into that interval, you would mark it down as I showed you here. Similarly, if the behavior occurred at the end of the interval, five seconds into the interval, just before it ended, we would still indicate it as an occurrence. At any point during the interval, if the behavior occurs, mark it down. This is a good recording system uh, to use on behaviors you want to decrease, such as self-stimulatory behaviors. 
The reason for this is because since we're capturing only a sample and the sample is at any time that it occurs in that interval, it will overestimate the behavior, making it a better choice for behaviors you want to decrease. Look at this slide here and notice that the intervals are 10 seconds long. You also want to notice that in the first interval, the behavior occurs near the beginning. In the 30 second interval, it occurred near the end. And in the 40 second interval, it occurred in the middle. How many times did the behavior occur during this observation period? The correct answer is three. It occurred during the 10, 30, and 40 second intervals. Now, when you're taking partial interval data, you're not tracking where in the interval um, the behavior occurred, but only whether it happened or not. I'm going through this as a way to demonstrate the importance of recognizing that any time the behavior occurs, no matter where in the interval, you will mark it down. Here is an example of a data sheet and partial interval um, data. We have six intervals of 10 seconds and a total observation period of five minutes. The therapist will mark a plus or minus depending on whether behavior occurred or not. And then we can turn this into a percentage to see how much of the time the learner engages in a specific behavior of interest. You would then convert the occurrences over the total intervals into a percentage. For example, the first minute the behavior occurred four out of the six intervals. You would then calculate the percentage by adding the occurrences divided by the total of the intervals to get 56.6%. Let's practice this. All right, so I'm gonna walk you through how to fill in a time sampling sheet. Now, uh, depending on where you're working, uh, the organization, they might have something similar to this, might be different, that's okay. Um, I just wanna walk you through it so you have an understanding of how to fill it in. And then we're gonna watch a video and actually take some, uh, some data uh, for more practice, uh, just so you feel more comfortable with this. So the first thing you wanna do is fill in the learner's name. So I'm gonna say that it's Johnny. Uh, please excuse the fast and quick handwriting that I'm doing for you guys here. Uh, the interval is, uh, the length of the interval is 10 seconds, and I know that because of the sheet. Now, if I wasn't sure, I might speak to my supervisor about how long um, the session time is going to, or the uh, interval time is going to be. Uh, next is the observation period. So um, this one is a five minute length of time. Uh, so let's suppose that it's uh, nine o'clock in the morning, and I'm going to do it till 9.05. Uh, the observer, so that's going to be whoever is observing and taking the uh, data. So I'm going to say that it's me, um, and we're going to put uh, a date. So I'm going to say, oops, uh, January, let's say 21st, uh, 2019. Um, now, this is probably the most important, um, you know, area here because you need to indicate uh, what kind of time sampling you are uh, recording here because it's going to make a world of a difference. So are you looking at partial interval? Are you looking at whole interval or momentary time sampling? So for this one, we're going to do partial interval. So um, we're going to actually be looking at uh, off task behavior. Okay. Um, now, again, another very important part is the operational definition. Um, if you don't know what the behavior looks like, then you won't know whether that's counted or not. So for the purposes of this uh, activity, um, we would have to, and, and for real life situations, you'd have to look at the behavior and observe it uh, before you actually go in to take data. So I might go in, take a look at the learner and notice that the learner looks up and away from their work. Uh, the learner rubs their temples, uh, they remove their glasses, um, they do, you know, those kinds of behaviors. So I would write that down right here. So removal of glasses, rubbing temples, um, maybe they play with their hair, again, depending on what it is. So for, for the purposes of this uh, video, um, and what we've seen this little girl do is she will remove her glasses. Um, so, you know, remove glasses. Uh, she will uh, rub. Uh, now we could say temples. We could write head uh, because maybe she does both, uh, depending. Um, and then uh, looks away or up. 
Okay, so these are some of the behaviors that we know that we've seen. And now what we're going to do is we're actually going to take a look at the video. And what I want you to do is get your timer ready. And what you'll do is for partial interval, you'll start the timer and it'll go. And then what you'll do is you'll look for the behavior. If it occurs, you're going to immediately put a plus if you see the off task behavior. If she's on task, then you're going to put a minus. Okay. And then you're basically looking at if it occurred at any point during that interval. Um, so if she looked away and then she started her work, it's still going to be a plus as she was off task for any time during that interval. So it's any time that it occurs. So let's take a look at the video and let's see what you guys get. All right, so you just watched the video and you uh, took the data. Um, the video is very short, so I just wanted you to get an example of, of taking the data and just the practice. So we're going to walk through it together. Um, so let's let's get it started. I want to play it a couple of times so we could go through it together. So I want you to notice that there's the behaviors, the rubbing of the forehead, uh, taking the glasses off, rubbing her temples. Um, so it all fits in into our off-task description. Um, and then she goes back and starts doing her work. So doing her work would really be looking down at the paper and writing something down. So now let's get our timer going because this is where it gets tricky for a lot of people. So I'm going to, once I press the space bar here, I'm gonna press my timer and I want you to do the same with your timer. Um, so remember we're taking partial interval data. So at any time that the behavior occurs, we don't really have to worry about the timer. So here we go. So she's off task and the timer's still going. So that's the first 10 seconds. So now we're into the next 10 seconds. She's still off task. So that's 20 seconds. Now, if we went into the third 10 seconds and let's say she was still on task, then we might have actually gotten uh, a minus saying that she um, was not uh, off task. So that's really how you would take the data here. Um, and so you can see in the first 10 seconds we got a plus and in the second 10 seconds we got a plus. Um, had she stayed on task during that last 10 seconds I was just talking about then you would have put a minus here but because we don't know um, that's the data that we got. Let's move on to whole interval. Whole interval recording is when you mark a behavior if it occurred during the entire interval. Again, the key here is the behavior must occur for the entire interval in order for you to count that it actually happened. So if the interval was 10 seconds long, the behavior occurred from the first second until the ninth second, let's say, you would not be able to count that as an occurrence because it didn't last the entire 10 seconds. For, for whole interval recording, the behavior has to occur the entire time. For example, it can occur for five seconds out of the 10 seconds, it can't be counted. If it occurred for nine seconds out of the 10 seconds, it can't be counted. If it occurred the entire 10 seconds, then you can count it as an occurrence. When the behavior occurs during an interval, similar to partial interval, you will mark it down using a plus or X for an occurrence and a minus or a zero for a non-occurrence. Whole interval data is a good measure for behaviors such as play or on-task behaviors. The use of whole interval methods will underestimate the behavior because not all occurrences are counted since they did not last the entire time. Therefore, using it on behaviors you want to increase such as play and on-task behaviors is great since those are behaviors you want to increase. Underestimating them is okay, but for problem behaviors, this would not be a good measure. In a nutshell, remember, with whole interval, you will need to ensure the behavior occurs for the entire interval. Use this measure on behaviors that we want to increase, and it will underestimate the behavior. 
All right, so now I wanna do another one where, you're, again, we can practice. So um, we're gonna write down the learner's name. So again, um, Johnny. Um, the length of the interval is 10 seconds, same as uh, the one that we did before. It's the way that the sheet is set up. Again, if it was a five second interval, then you would write five seconds. Uh, the observation period, let's say it's between 10 and 10.05. The observer is Shaza. The date is March 10th, 2019. Um, the what we're looking at here now is not partial interval like the first one that we did but we're looking at whole interval um, so you're gonna mark that down there um, and now the behavior that we're looking at is eye contact um, again the operational definition is important here so you'll have to define what eye contact is so it might be looking up at the adult uh, it might be holding eye gaze um, for about a second, two seconds, depending on what the, the description is, you would indicate that here so you know what you're counting. Now remember, um, if we were looking at um, eye contact and we're looking at 10 second, inter um, 10 second intervals, then really they would have to be looking, in order for them to get this as a score, they'd have to be looking at the person for the whole 10 seconds. So then you have to go back to your operational definition and make sure that that makes sense. So if you said looking up at the adult for one second, then they would never get that correct. Um, so it'd have to be looking up at the adult for at least the 10 seconds plus um, so that you're able to score it. So if they look for 10 seconds, they're gonna get a plus. If they are, if they don't look for the 10 seconds, uh, the whole 10 seconds, then they'll get a minus. Um, and so that's what you're looking at. So they have to look, the behavior that we're looking to increase because we're doing whole interval is eye contact. And so we're gonna watch the video now. And if the child looks for the whole time, the whole 10 seconds, they'll get a plus. If they don't, um, look, uh, even if they look for a split second and they look down, that would still con be considered uh, no eye contact. And so we would not be able to count it. All right, so let's take a look at the video. All right, so I'm gonna walk you through this video now. So um, you just saw it, did you put pluses or minuses? Now this video is very short. So again, we're looking at a 10 second interval. Uh, we could make our intervals shorter so we could have five seconds so um, you could take a look, but this is just for practice purposes. So basically what you're going to do is you're gonna get your timer ready. I'm going to go, does he look up at the teacher? Yes or no, here we go. Get your timer going. And so for the first 10 seconds, which is now, uh, you can see that he did not look up, so that should have been a minus. Um, and then in the next little bit, we, we got about another four seconds or so, uh, you could see that he's still not looking up. So if you were tracking this behavior, um, you would have to look and see if the eye contact's there, but then you also have to look at your timer, and usually that's the challenge uh, with whole interval, uh, but with practice, again, uh, you'll get better. So keep practicing this and, um, and just make sure that you um, are able to look at the timer to make sure that it's occurring the whole time uh, and uh, watching the, the behavior to ensure that it is happening. Finally, momentary time sampling is when the behavior is observed at the end of the interval. The observer looks up at the end of that interval when a timer goes off and looks to see if the behavior is occurring or not. The advantage to this method is the observer doesn't need to observe continuously and only needs to look at the end to see if the behavior is happening or not. The problem with this method is many behaviors get missed. Momentary time sampling should not be used for short-lived low-frequency behaviors because you'd never see them. This method of measuring behavior is known for over and underestimating behaviors when intervals were more than two minutes in length. When intervals were less than two minutes, the results were very much like continuous measures, such as frequency data. This method is great in classroom settings when a teacher needs to observe multiple children. A teacher can take data on several children rotating around the room. This slide here is a summary of what we just discussed. Partial interval is recorded at any time during the interval. 
watch for the behavior. Once it occurs, you don't need to look for the behavior anymore. This method will overestimate the behavior and is great uh, to measure behaviors you want to decrease. Whole interval recording is when you observe the behavior during the entire time. You watch for the behavior from the beginning until the end, ensuring that, the, that it lasted the entire time. This method will underestimate the behavior so it's best used for behaviors you want to increase. Momentary time sampling is when you observe the behavior at the end. You don't need to look at the learner the entire time. You only look when the timer beeps. This measure may over or underestimate the behavior and can be used for any behavior. Which method observes a behavior at the end of the interval? A. Whole interval B. Partial interval C. Momentary time sampling or D. Time delay sampling And the correct response is C. Momentary time sampling which method reports an occurrence at any time during the interval? A. Whole interval B. Partial interval C. Momentary time sampling or D. Time delay sampling And the correct response is B. Partial interval which method of time sampling must observe the behavior during the entire interval? A. Whole interval B. Partial interval C. Momentary time sampling or D. Time delay sampling And the correct response is whole interval. Great job! Partial interval recording is recorded when A. At the end B. During the entire interval C. Count it throughout the day or D. Any time And the correct response is D. Any time Whole interval recording is recorded when A. At the end B. During the entire interval C. Count it throughout the day or D, any time. And the correct response is B, during the entire interval. Momentary time sampling is recorded when A, at the end, B, during the entire interval, C, count it throughout the day, or D, any time. And the correct response is A, at the end. We're going to move into the last task list item, which is permanent product. However, here comes another Scrabble word. This was a word that I nearly used up all my letters. It was a wild guess. I didn't know it was a word, but I got a lot of points for it. And the word is niggle, spelled N-I-G-G-L-E. This means to worry over petty details. Okay, so uh, take a quick stretch and let's dive into permanent products. Permanent products is when a behavior is measured after it has occurred. They can be used in all environments such as school, home, and so on. Permanent product recording is relatively easy to use. Teachers often use this when grading a math or a spelling test. It can be used to observe behaviors by checking written work, completed worksheets, homework assignments that have been turned in, audio tapes, videotapes, and so on. Measure number of the correct responses in academic tasks such as spelling tests or math tests. Measure productivity per unit of time. For example, one can measure number of envelopes stuffed per hour. Some behaviors cannot leave a permanent product unless videotaped or audiotaped. A benefit to permanent products is that it allows practitioners to be absent during the observation period. 
they can review the worksheet or video session at a later time. Permanent product measures can be more accurate. For example, a practitioner can slow down or pause the video. Um, they do require time though um, that the practitioner actually has to make time later to sit down and watch these videotapes or listen to the audio tapes. So here is an example. If this was a worksheet submitted to you and you needed to score it, how many did the learner get correct? Eight are correct and you could turn that into a percentage very easily. You have a learner that screams long periods of time and you would like to decrease the behavior. However, you only see the client once a week for 30 minutes. What is the best method of measurement? A frequency, B partial interval recording, or C duration? And the correct response is B, partial interval recording. You have a learner that engages in self hits. You want to take data on this behavior. You have sessions three times a week and each session is two hours. What is the best method of measurement? A, frequency, B, rate, C, duration. And the correct response is A, frequency. Your supervisor is observing the learner. You find that your supervisor looks up after the timer beeps. What method of measurement is being used here? A, momentary time sampling. B, partial interval recording. C, whole interval recording. And the correct response is A, momentary time sampling. Well done. You want to take data on the learner's play behavior. You set aside five minutes and prepared your data sheet, which has 10 second intervals. You will indicate whether the behavior occurred only if it was present during the entire interval. Which method of measurement are you using? A, momentary time sampling. B, whole interval recording, or C, duration. And the correct response is B, whole interval recording. Your supervisor is concerned about the time between responses during intensive teaching. She finds that the learner is too slow at responding. What method of measurement is best used? A, duration. B. Latency. C. Inner response time. And the correct response is C. Inner response time. Way to go. You tell your learner to clean up. You start your timer and find that it took him 20 seconds before engaging in the cleaning up behavior. What method of measurement did you use? A. Latency. B. Inner response time. C. Duration. And the correct response is A. Latency. Your learner is engaging in spitting behavior. You start taking data. On Monday, he had five spits in a three-hour session. On Tuesday, he had 18 in a five-hour session. And on Friday, he had nine spits in a three-hour session. What measure should be used? A, frequency, B, rate, or C, duration? And the correct response is B, rate. 
Kelly is an RBT and she reviewed video footage of her learner engaging in aggressive behaviors at home. This is an example of A. Frequency B. Time sampling C. Permanent products or D. Frequency products. And the correct response is C. Permanent products. Well done. All right, so let's talk about my final thoughts here. If we didn't collect data, we would never know the direction of the behavior. If it is improving or not, as an RBT or a practitioner, you want to ensure that behavior change is occurring. We can only know this by measuring the right dimension of the behaviors and collecting the data accurately. Avoid being sloppy in your work or relying on others to collect the data. Write your data down immediately. Don't rely on your memory because you'll forget or get busy. Don't ever fabricate your data. Adding more teaching trials or increased percentages just so you can look good or those can say that you took good data because honesty and integrity are crucial in our practice. Suppose the therapist fabricated her data and said that she, prompt, you know, she was prompting a child to request for toys 90 times in a 30 minute session, but yet the learner is unable to request independently at all. I would really start questioning the skill, teaching and trials. Being honest is important because you will feel good and at ease at the end of the day. Remember, the learner is as good as their teacher or therapist is. The better you are, the more skilled and trained you are in supporting your learners, the better they will be. And remember why you're doing this and how it's going to help your learner. The greatest feeling in the world is really when a program or protocol has been implemented and you're tracking the behavior and you're seeing positive changes. Thank you for joining me today during our measurement class. I'll see you at our next class. Instruments. So um, what we're going to do here is actually get some frequency data. So I want you to count how many times he shakes the maracas. Okay, so we're going to try to contrive those situations. Every time that he does, what you'll need is something that'll look like this, a tally counter. And what you're going to do is you're going to count the number of times. So I'm going to hide mine. And then we're going to uh, count those behaviors. And I'll tell you when to start. All right, let's put everything inside here. Put it inside. Eight. Hey, you're doing the count for us. Hold on, hold on. Ooh. All right, here we go. Ready? Close your eyes. We're going to play a game. It's called Find the Right Instrument. Okay, here we go. Open your eyes. Which one are you going to go with first? I will use triangle. You use the triangle. I'm going to use the, what is this called? A tambourine. A tambourine. Okay, ready? And are we going to sing a song? Yes. Okay, here we go. Oh. If you're happy and you know If you're it. happy and you know Do you think you're happy today? Yes. I think I'm happy today. All right, here we go. If you're happy and you know it. Clap your hands. Clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your and if you're happy and you know it and you really wanna, if you're happy and you know it, clap your. Okay, now it's time to pick a different instrument. Which one are you going to pick? Hmm. I don't know. I could use this one. Okay, I guess I'll go with this one. And we're gonna sing a really fast song now. Ready? If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then you really want to show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. All right, pick a different instrument. Hmm. I could use this. I wanted that one, please. Okay. Oh, perfect. You took the maracas. Okay, you take the maraca, and I'm going to take the tambourine. Are you ready? Go. I'm going to. I'm going to let you sing. Okay. And go. What about the maracas? Oh, that's banging it on the table. Can you shake it for me? All right, here we go. And go. 
but you're not singing. I can't sing. You can't sing. Okay. So, um, so you could see that it was really hard for us to count the shaking of the maraca because it wasn't very clear. The beginning and end wasn't super clear for us. So what I'm going to do is define the behavior both for him and for ourselves so that we can count the behavior. Ready? This is what I want it to look like. Can you try that? So you're going to do one and I'm going to do one. Here we go. When I say go, all right? And go. All right, stop. So how many do you think we got? I'm going to take a look at mine. How many times do you think we shook the, ta the uh, maracas? Do you know? I don't know. Hmm, I'm going to tell you. Take a peek and you tell our audience. Eleven. Eleven. All right, let's do it again. We're going to zero it up. Oops. We're going to do it again this time, okay? Hold it with, hold it with your... Now hold it with gonna, this hand. Now we're going to make... The last number. It's why we gotta get twenty shakes. You wanna do twenty six? No, let's do right, so are you ready? Let's we're do gonna, twenty. We're gonna start counting. Here we go. Are you counting in your head? Stop. How many do you think we got? Let's See what we got. Well, what did you notice? Did we go a little faster, making it a little harder? All right, here we go. What do you think we got? Tell everybody at home. It's 21. 21. Ding, 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 ding. Good job. Okay, but, so now. But we can't find Marshall. I know. We're going to look for him. So as you can see, we got 21 this time. The thing that I did a little differently was I went a little faster. So hopefully you are going a little faster with us. If you didn't get 21, uh, keep practicing because these frequency counts are really important to make sure that you guys are counting the behavior. But as you can really see that knowing what the behavior is and defining it is going to make it so much easier when you're tracking that behavior. Okay. So the next thing we're gonna do is take some duration data. Now I'm gonna give our little guy here some tasks to do. What you're gonna do is time and see how long it takes him to complete all three tasks. Are you ready? Yes. All right, so here are the cards. You're gonna put them in order as quickly as possible, okay? Starting with this one and go. Does this count? Uh, I think you got it right. All right, I'll check your work later. Let's just move it. Now you can do the blue one here. Does this count? All right, I'll check your work in a minute. Do the last one. Is it purple? It is the purple one. Does this count? Are you done? When you're done, say, I'm done. I'm done. All right. Good work. So now you can see that he completed the work. I said go and stop just to help you guys out a little bit. How long did you get for the duration of that activity? So I got, what did I get? Can you read that number for everybody? It's 41. Seconds. 41 seconds that's right 41 seconds and a little bit so if you got anything around that so if you got 40 or 42 that's okay too because it was very close sometimes with duration data you can't get it exact on somebody else but that's close enough well done all right so we're gonna do latency I'm gonna give him the shape sorter and now we're gonna start the timer when I say do the shape sorter and we're gonna stop the timer once he engages in the activity which is actually putting the pieces into the shape sorter all right, do the shape sorter. And so now you can see that it took him, I got about 13 seconds before he started engaging in the correct behavior. And that was the latency amount. Hey, look. Well done. I did it. Yeah, you did it. Superstar. 
All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some inner response uh, data. So I'm gonna show him a picture, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna time from the end of the response of one to the beginning of the response of the next one to see how long it takes between each response. Are you ready, buddy? Here we go, I'm gonna show you a picture. You're gonna tell me what you see, okay? What is she doing? She is putting ice cream in the bowl. That's right, what about this one? is getting all of the ice cream stuff. Good, all right. So you wanna put these in order for me again? So here you could see I started my timer when he responded to the first card I showed him. Um, and then by the time he responded to the next card, um, I got about five seconds. So you should roughly get a, about the same amount of time. We're gonna do this one more time. Hey, look. You did it. I okay, did it. I'm gonna zero up my timer. Let's do this again. Uh, can I have this one here? And this one here? Okay, here we go, ready? Gonna show you the card. All right, show me hands ready and sitting at the table like a superstar. Can I get a high 10 first, a low 10? What are we gonna do after this? Find Marshall. I know, we have everybody looking for Marshall. I wonder where he is. Do you want, oh, do you want the big Marshall? Do you want the big stuffed Marshall? I think there's one, let's see, is that Marshall there? That's Chase. Oh, that's Chase, oops. Okay, Marshall is the one that's wearing red? Is he the firefighter dog? Yes. Oh, okay. But, right. but very big Marshall doesn't fit in the, in the fire truck. Okay, so we'll have to get a small Marshall so he could fit in the fire truck, right? Right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's get started. Ready? Tell me what's happening in this picture. The girl was squeezing the chocolate syrup. Great. And what about this one here? She is eating ice cream. She is. What flavor do you think she's eating? Vanilla ice cream. What's your favorite flavor? Cherry. Cherry? Wow, mine is chocolate. And mine is cherry. Cherry. Okay, how long do you think it took between those two responses? It gives me one. You want to tell everybody? Likes. How long did it take between the two responses? Is it five seconds? It says five seconds, yeah. So it took five. That was similar to the last one. Well done. All right, I think we're done.
All right, everyone. So the competency assessment here is really just to help you guys out, practice. Uh, so please review the videos and practice as many times as you can. You'll probably find that taking frequency and duration data were easier than the time sampling uh, examples that were given. Uh, so do practice uh, getting better with your timer, uh, looking at your timer and being able to uh, identify the behavior that you're looking at and, uh, and practice as much as you can and good luck and and we'll see you at the next class.